Well, hello everyone and welcome to our guest lecture presentation for today. Um, before we make a formal start, I would like to welcome Rachel Winwood, who works with Gimmedy College of Indigenous Australian Peoples here to acknowledge country for us. Rachel is a long-standing and deeply respected member of the Southern Cross University community and holds um, numerous, many, many leadership positions across the university, including Chair of Faculty Board, Academic Integrity Officer, Co-Chair of Gimmedy Elders Council and respected CIRCLE member amongst others. Um, yeah, given your hugely busy schedule, Rachel, we really deeply appreciate um, that you're here with us today um, to acknowledge country for us. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks for inviting me along, Simone, to um, yeah, do an acknowledgement before you get underway with your event. Um, so just to, to acknowledge as a Bundjalung woman and also as um, Simone rightly outlined, a member of the Southern Cross academic community, um, to acknowledge that uh, we that, that we're meeting on Widgeable Wyable Country and Widgeable Wyable peoples being of the wider Bundjalung Nation is country we're meeting on, some of us live on, and uh, some of us work on. And as with any acknowledgement, we always uh, pay our love, respect, and honour to elders past, present, and emerging. And we um, acknowledge everyone that's here, um, always acknowledging non-Indigenous people equally, and that this is an event that, um, and events like this are always about community. They're always about building relationships and very solid, genuine collaborations. And um, certainly my many years of experience in working at a community level in various settings is all about that. Um, it's very much all about working with everyone of all cultural backgrounds and walks of life and um, to, to, to bring a, to bring more of a meaningful um, approach and uh, productiveness to what we do. So I trust you'll all have a wonderful event today and um, that you'll gain much from your guest presenter who will be uh, speaking with you all um, at this RAMP Innovation Hub meeting. So once again, just to acknowledge, um, yes, from Widjibal Wairabal country of the wider Bundjalung nation. Thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy the, um, the, the rest of the meeting today. Thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, an honour to have you here. Thank you. Okay, so I'll now move to um, introduce our guest today, uh, Colin Sykes. So Colin is the owner of Winona, a 2,000 acre property in the central tablelands of New South Wales. Here he runs and um, feel free to update if some of these stats are incorrect, Colin. Around 4,000 merino sheep, a merino stud and grows approximately 500 acres of crops annually using his pasture cropping technique. Having developed and adopted these techniques in 1993, Colin has become a pioneer in regenerative agriculture. Colin's work has been recognised by the prestigious Central West Conservation Farmer of the Year Award, the Nation Carbon Farmer, the Australian Green Agricultural Innovation Award, which is awarded for leading contributions to soil health and sequestration of carbon, and Australia's most prestigious farming and environmental award, the National Bob Hawke Landcare Award. Colin is also a writer, publishing the book Custodians of the Grassland about his family's journey in regen ag. And Colin, we are absolutely delighted to have you with us today. Um, I'll, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it is a pleasure to, to uh, be here and, and I guess discuss a bit of uh, uh, methods that I developed, but but a journey along the way, which is um, not always uh, forward, a lot of backward as well. Uh, and, and interesting to sort of be in, be in this space as well, the original, I guess, adopters of some of the regen ag stuff. 
So we better start this presentation because it will take a while. Um, and I am looking forward to questions after, which, which will be, which will be um, uh, very good. Okay, I'm hoping that that works. It's always a problem. Okay. Yes, that's great, Colin. We can see it perfectly. Very good. Um, now, our farming future, uh, it's, it's often difficult, to, well, not difficult, to, uh, trying to work out how you start a presentation. But this one I thought was very, very uh, apt to um, what we're doing today. Um, I think we've probably already covered this introduction. I'll just go through it very, quite quickly. Um, as you mentioned, a couple of thousand acres here on central tablelands north of Golgong, town, small town called Golgong. It's about 600 mil rainfall and uh, just granite soil. And now it's restored uh, native grassland. Um, I've got things all over this screen. I'll see if I can get rid of some. That'll help. <laughs> um, okay, and uh, we've already been through that. One of the things that I will comment on is um, one of the enterprises that, that we've developed over the year, years here uh, is uh, native grass seed sales. And, that, and that's happened because we've, we've fully restored not only the, the property itself, but the whole farm ecosystem, which I will talk a lot about. You'll get sick of me talking about ecosystems. Um, so does farming have a future is something that we all should discuss. And, and um, I think, yes, farming does have a future, but not if we continue to practice business as usual. And that business as usual is, is basically the industrial agriculture model. And I will go through that and talk about why I, I'm saying that. So. This plan of ours is in serious trouble. Uh, and it is in serious trouble because for 10,000 years, we've killed grasslands and destroyed soil by growing crops and grazing animals. The 10,000 years is, is there because that's basically when we started agriculture and that was started around, around the Middle East, Mesopotamia, really. So. But what we've done over many hundreds of years, really, is instead of improving agricultural methods, we've actually made things worse. And part of the uh, development and the adoption of regenerative agriculture practices is, is related to what I was just talking about. If we look at what's going on around the world, 10 tonne of soil is lost for every one, every tonne of grain that's produced. Grazing doesn't miss out either because uh, there's over 50 billion tonnes of eroding soil lost to agriculture each year. So uh, uh, and that's huge. If we look at this plant of ours, it's the only one we've got. We've got nowhere else to go to. So we better look after this one. So high rates of fertiliser and pesticides have really done a lot of damage to our, to our farms and soil. And it's damaged our farms and soils because it's been an ecological disaster. We tend to, we do tend to look at, at often the wrong reasons why agriculture's crashed because far, the farm ecosystems and soil ecosystems have crashed. So, and increasing fertilizer and pesticides won't fix our farms. Um, our farms don't function because of lack of pesticides <laughs> or fertilizer. The farm and soil ecosystems are, are basically stuffed, really. So the way crops are, are growing using, using plows and excessive uh, herbicides and pesticides over many years have killed grasslands, destroyed soil ecosystems and, and, and farm ecosystems. And the industrial crop growing methods, that is plowing soil made as, to start with, um, like in this country, plowing soil started at least in a big, big sense, 150 or so years ago, more than that probably now. But plowing soil has been a major cause of, of destroyed grasslands and degraded soils. Grasslands and soils don't, don't uh, tolerate the dish plow very well. So, and 
what's happened as we so-called modernized our cropping methods, we've just simply replaced the plow with the boom spray and pesticides. We haven't, we haven't um, uh, uh, changed the, 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 the philosophy of farming, really. We, we've just changed the equipment. So around the world, the way crops are grown, we just saw carbon levels, which makes inefficient use of rainfall, or if someone is, is irrigating, inefficient use of water. Reduced soil fer fertility means we need to put more fertilizer on. Increased insect attack means more insecticide. Increased crop disease, more fungicide. Now, a lot of this stuff I'm talking about, I have, have no doubt you've probably heard all this before. Um, and <laughs> it all sounds like a, 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 a big heap of misery and, and, and people want to go and slash their wrists. <laughs> but um, uh, in this talk, we will certainly have some more positive things than what I'm going to talk about now for a little bit. So all the, these problems uh, that we have, have in agriculture are symptoms of the way crops are grown and it's symptoms of the way we graze animals as well. And excessive fertilizer and pesticides are then used to prop up a broken agricultural system. So the way we graze animals, it, it, we get the same type of results, kill grasslands, pasture, or, or the same thing, destroyed farm and soil, soil ecosystems. Now, the problem that we have is that grazing techniques haven't changed much for hundreds of years. Um, and those grazing techniques have done a lot of damage. But animals can be very beneficial if they graze well, and they are a big part of the answer to fixing our, our farms. Um, uh, grasslands around the world have evolved with animals and are very dependent on animals uh, to restore them. Now, just to move on a bit, after the Second World War, there, there were concerns about producing enough food for the increasing world, world populations. So a new agricultural revolution was developed to solve these problems. And this you would have heard about, but labeled the Green Revolution, it developed new high yielding crops and fertilizer and pesticides were produced to help crops yield to the maximum. So and that Green Revolution was actually very successful in that it achieved what it set out to do. It produced huge amounts of food, it reduced hunger and poverty, it created wealth, wealth for, far, for farmers. I'm going to talk about this in a personal sense, uh, it would happen on my property here shortly as well. So, sounds like an ideal method of agriculture, what could possibly go wrong? Um, it, is, it actually has created many problems. It, it's been an ecological disaster for our farms and the, and the planet. Uh, destroys farm ecosystems, depends on fertilizer, all that stuff, um, depends on pesticides. It has created a reduction in food quality and human health problems. And now, wealth is now with multinational companies. When it first started, wealth was, was with farmers. Uh, but now the whole thing's done a big turnaround. This graph here has actually been produced in Canada by some researchers in Canada, but it can be overlaid straight onto what's happened in Australia. And as you can see from that, from 1926 to 2016, from the 1930s to about nearly 1980, or 19, at least the mid 1970s, farmers were doing okay multinational or agribusiness is a better way to, to describe this. Agribusiness was always making a profit, but after, after about 1980, agribusiness profits started to go through the roof and farmers going broke. Now remember this is Canadian data, but our, our farming system is just, is really mirror, virtually mirror all of this. Um, I, pre-virus I presented in the US, um, at a conference, put this data up, and that, the Americans were quite shocked by it because this data only came from over the fence, just north of them. Uh, and uh, it, it applies pretty well any, anywhere around the world where we've had industrial agriculture practiced. 
Um, so there's something seriously wrong here when you've got agribusiness making billions of dollars while farmers are going broke. And again, that's what started to, has started to drive a lot of regenerative agricultural practices are being adopted. And one of the, 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 thing, the most common things that I see when I get around, uh, I, I, people contact me to, to do some on-farm work with them and help them get through a lot of this stuff, is the cost of production. Cost of production is, is, is uh, with making most, most farmers struggle with their agricultural practices. So many of the things we do in agriculture make someone else wealthy, not farmers. In fact, farmers seem to be getting the wrong, the wrong end of the pineapple all the time. <laughs> we, we, uh, uh, we get, and, and uh, so that needs to change. So to move on and explain a bit more of, of that, but what happened to my family on the practical side of this, my great grandparents um, were some of the, the original pioneer selectors in the district in the 1860s. Um, they produced merino sheep um, and on, on the property like here and started growing wheat in 1868. Um, the photo on the bottom left hand corner, I'll bring that up again in a minute, but for a different reason. Just moving on a few years, my father. Uh, adopt in the 1930s adopted um, industrial agriculture and started growing wheat in, 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 in uh, early 1930s. The photo there on the left is standing in an extremely good wheat crop. Uh, I might add, we never stand in a, in a failure and get our photo taken. We always stand in one of our best crops. <laughs> but he didn't use fertilizer or pesticides uh, at, at that time. There was no pesticides available anyway. But there, there, um, there was uh, the start of fertilizer uh, for superphosphate starting to be adopted. But early days, he used no, no fertilizer or pesticides at all. So basically an organic crop. However, as he moved on, he started using more and more uh, fertilizer. Now, my father, and this applies more, more to the previous slide, but mostly to the next slide I'm going to show. My father, Harry Siles, adopted methods that regarded as the best science of the time. And we need to remember this when we talk about the Green Revolution stuff. Um, so he, he, was, he was a, a great innovator and adopted the best science that there was available. So from 1950 to 1978 on the property here, he sowed all, everything to um, annual, par annual introduced pasture. The reason why he, he had to do that was because uh, the cropping methods he was using destroyed all his grassland. He had no, he had no feed left for, for his stock. And we're doing exactly the same thing now with, with, in, crop, in cropping uh, with, with, with wheat and, and all the cropping methods being used. We mightn't be using plows as much now, but we're still killing these with pesticides and herbicides. So he annually fertilised this property here with, with superphosphate uh, from 19... From 1950 to 1978, um, and carrying cold bunny to sow crops because that was the only way it could be done. High use of fertilizer and pesticides, set stop grazing, no rotation, that's the way it was done. But importantly, that high input system was very productive during that era. It, it actually worked. Um, and a lot of people uh, set themselves up and bought, bought uh, 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 other farms be, or uh, neighboring farms using these methods. Um, I came home from school in 1970 uh, and, and <laughs> continued with the, the um, uh, methods that my father was using. And basically I continued to destroy the property. <laughs> with, uh, and I was really fortunate that my father didn't give me a bigger plow because I would have done a lot more damage than I did. So uh, when that's, really what the, the, the property looked like. It quite amazes me now and shocks me now what the property looks like, looked like. Um, so what I was actually doing was growing plants that wanted to die and killing plants that wanted to live. And that's mainly what we do in agriculture today. I mean, I don't do that here anymore, but that's what agriculture really is about, uh, growing things that want to die and kill things that, that want to live. So. 
over time, the industrial agricultural model that my father adopt, ad, 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 well, adopted, then I adopted after him, was doing serious ecolo ecological damage to the property. And on today's figures or 2020 figures, it was costing us over $80,000 annually just to keep that system going. Going. I've actually got to update that because it would be probably over $100,000 now with the increase in fertilizer and, and all of that. So a huge amount of money uh, j just to keep yourself you know, ticking along. Um, so, so hybrid industrial, uh, industrial agriculture started to crash on the property during the 1970s. One of the reasons why fertilizer it was because fertilizer costs started to, to rise, cost of selling pasture was too high. We had lost soil structure also. Um, now, a lot of this happens quite insidiously. You don't, don't, you don't realize if it happens over 20 or 30 or 40 years, don't realize how much damage is being done. So soil structure uh, was lost and soil became acidic. Uh, salinity problems, trees dying, rainfall down long, infiltrated. And we were, we were really going broke. And you have to remember when this was, it was in the 1970s. Um, and it's related to this, you come back to this graph again, where we crashed in, in the late in 1970s is, is, is pretty well where this graph shows, uh, this Canadian graph. And of course, for the same types of reasons, our, the cost to, from the father became too high uh, and the farming methods, uh, which were the best, the best science of the day, started to crash. So how do we fix these problems? That's really the, the big one. Um, how do we fix them? Now, I've got this slide up here, not to suggest that we go to, back to bark huts and horse themes, but, but I want to talk about the old, well, the couple in the photo. Now, the couple in the photo are my great grandparents. And the observers amongst you will obviously notice that he's only got one leg. And he, he lost that leg. Uh, he fell off a wagon, got run over, and had to have his leg amputated. Now, where I'm getting at here, today, it would be very difficult to manage a property with one leg. In the 1880s, when this, ha when this happened, um, even more difficult, extremely difficult to, to run a pl property with, 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 with one leg. What they did was switch roles. There was nine kids in the family. He went in and looked after the, kid, the kids. And Granny here, that lady on, on the lady sitting down there, she went out and ran, ran the property. Now, she had one advantage in that, well, she had two advantages. She, the, the first advantage she had was she was female. The second advantage she had was that she was a shepherd's daughter. Um, she and, and she knew a lot about sheep. But better than that, she managed the property the way she wanted to. And from what I can gather from uh, my father and other older members in the family, she was a cranky old bugger too, and she did things her way. So, <laughs> anyway, um, but what she really did, being female, she managed the livestock differently. She managed the property differently. She nurtured the animals and the farm. And... What she really did, she was uh, became really close to her firstborn grandson. Her firstborn grandson and, and, uh, had, was influenced greatly by her. Her firstborn grandson happened to be my father. And her legacy of how to manage a property and how to manage animals with uh, uh, by my nurturing was totally different to what us males do. Us males... Uh, I'll, I'll talk about myself, <laughs> not blame anyone, anyone else, but how I used to think about farming, you get up in the morning and you try to work out what you're going to kill today. <laughs> and my, my house kill things with plows and bulldozers and pesticides. Women, on the other hand, are nurturers. <laughs> you can't help yourself, it's the way you are. Um, and uh, But what a wonderful thing. Agriculture should be about nurturing, not about killing things. So where I'm getting at with this long-winded story is that we need more women involved in agriculture. 
We need more women involved in all forms of agriculture, not, not only on the land, but and, and from advisory uh, uh, situations like ag agronomy and scientists, and, as well as on the land. Then we'll start to turn around agriculture quite quickly. If, if we have more nurturers on managing our properties, I think we can fix a lot of our problems just uh, almost immediately. Anyway, moving on from that. So um, if we nurture our, 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 our farms and, and get the functioning ecosystems, we will restore our, 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 our soil structure, improve nutrient cycling, improve water infiltration, improve soil water holding capacity, all of that improves soil carbon. And as we do that, we will reduce inputs of fertilizer and pesticides and increase profit. So how and why did I change? So 1979, we had a major bushfire and we lost everything here on the property. Um, we lost everything like the house, uh, the main homestead, shearing sheds, 3,000 sheep were killed in it, all buildings destroyed, pretty well made all the fencing. And so we get, went from going okay to, to no money, it broke overnight. And how do you survive from that? Well, one of the things you do is, is it really is learn to have a sense of humour. It's about the only way you can survive. But we actually had a thousand years survive, which we used to rebuild our, 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 our sheep numbers. And um, what we did with those years, we just, we kept them here and, and, and bred from them. And we kept them here uh, on the property my father and I, neither of us had the heart to sell them as they got older. And we let we, we thought they deserved the right to die on the property. And some of them lived until they were 14, 15 years old, still rearing lambs. But they got us out of trouble. Um, and uh, there's, uh, yeah, and most of those old ewes, <laughs> they had no ears left because their ears were burnt off. And the, one, the ones that, that uh, didn't have their ears burnt off had tags melted into their ears. But... That, it's amazing um, what they did. They, they they bred a lot of lamb lambs for us and got us out of trouble. It is a way we, the, 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 certainly the way we, we got out of trouble. There's a few, quite a lot of other things we did. I did too after the initial fire. What I started to do do on the property because we had no I had no money at all. It was all financially driven. I looked for low input agricultural methods in 1980s. Uh, Stop using pasture fertilizer and pesticides. In 1980, I, I adopted holistic plan grazing in 1993. It, it it wasn't called holistic plan grazing then, then, uh, but that's what it, it's, it is called now. And and uh, I developed pasture cropping in 1993 as well. Then combined the two of those in 1995, and that's what really drove the change. Um, I started to focus on full ground cover, um, and and. And, and focused on restoring the property to, to grassland, native grassland. Now, in the 1980s, no one was thinking about this stuff. Like a, a low in, or input, well, in my case, that'd be a no input agriculture method, because I had no money. We, those uh, people were doing that with regard to very, very poor farmers. But that was the only way that I, I was going to survive. So I didn't know at the time, but I probably got into regenerative agriculture in the 1980s. Uh, uh, mainly through necessity. Now, just to get on to grazing. Um, so, on grazing management, what we're doing here, holistic plan grazing, generally two mobs of sheep, adult sheep, about two and a half thousand, um, and, and about 1,500 under one year olds, like hoggets. When we've got cattle, which isn't that often, they're included with sheep. Um, 75 paddocks here now, three to four or even five month plant recovery time in, in a grazing rotation. And we're using ad, the adult sheep to prepare paddocks to plant crops into, to pasture crop into. So, so, but really better grazing management can restore grassland pastures and soil. I'm not going to talk very little about how to in this, this here today because of, of lack of time, but just talk about what what we did and but the results that that, that we achieve here at home here is is probably more important than how to at the moment. That's just a photo of two and a half thousand ewes with their lambs. There's about five thousand sheep in that mob. I'm actually moving them through a gateway. This is 
where they're not grazed at that density. <laughs> so uh, pasture cropping, which is actually perennial cover cropping, uh, it, it is, and, and which is growing a crop into a dormant perennial grassland. I uh, developed, uh, as, as I said earlier, in 1993. Um, that was a big change for us. We, we could retain the grassland or retain the perennial plants. Just, just look in that photo, I won't dwell on it too long. The green in that oat crop is, uh, are the native perennial grasses emerging under the, under the, under the crop. Um, so we can retain and enhance our grasslands while growing crops. I developed multi-species um, uh, uh, pasture cropping in 1993, uh, 2010, sorry. Um, that's just a photo of, of a multi-species crop. Um, so what I did here, 93 change the grazing management uh, and, and, and pasture cropping, 2010 developed multi-species pasture cropping, and I didn't plant or sow any native, native species here. A lot, a lot of people think that I, I sowed native grasses, but all that I did was manage for them and they came back naturally. And, and I encourage people to, to do that. Now, if, if, if we get it right, uh, these grasses will, will return uh, themselves because there's enough seeds still in the soil on most properties if we can stimulate the germination of, those seed, that, of that seed. So trials and research work. Um, the property here is one of the most researched properties in Australia. Um, the, so, and the reason I did it, when I started, when I changed, I could see all these amazing things happening. Like uh, the soils got softer to start with, so like soil structure improved. I was getting uh, 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 native grasses germinating in the drill rows where I was sowing crops. Uh, species uh, were returning that hadn't never seen on, on the property. Um, and things were starting to happen. And the reason why I thought, I, I really need to, to get some, some data on this, is that I was thinking, gee, this, this, is, ha this is not supposed to happen. No, but, uh, no bath is going to believe this unless I get some data on, 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 on what was going on. So, as I said, it is one of the most researched companies in Australia. CSIRO work was done, some of this work was done quite early. 2005, CSIRO did work on mostly water nitrogen plant biomass. Sydney Uni did many, quite a lot of studies, um, uh, ecological studies. They weren't full research work, but they, they were mostly studies. Canberra Uni students did, did etymology studies um, as well as pasture cropping. Land Institute in the USA uh, did a research, did some research on pasture cropping there. All, all, the, all these, this stuff's available. Um, and there's numerous studies on soil microbiology and, and, and plants. So, but the outcomes of the results on, on the property was restored farm ecosystem. And we're going to remember, I spent no money on fertilizer um, uh, and all I was doing was managing for the stuff that I wanted. All that I want, I, I, I uh, restored the ground cover and, and, and then started to restore the, the, the grassland. So, but the soil ecosystem started to fall into place as well as I restored, restored the, the, the plants or, or as they came back, I didn't do much at all other than get out of the way, really. And that's part of what we do in agriculture or especially industrial agriculture is get in the way too much. And we, we want to manipulate things and change things. Uh, we need to let mother nature give her a bit of time to fix it. So, but anyway, here, uh, we started with about nine species, a native native grassland species. Now there's, there's 60 here. Um, and annual weeds decreased from 60% to less than five um, since 1999, which is when I was, was started monitoring a lot of this stuff. So uh, I don't know, we, we, ha we haven't um, uh, used um, uh, pesticides for uh, insecticides, sorry, for, for over 25 years. We don't get insect attack in, in crops or pasture. Now, how is that? Um, but there was some work done, Elise Wenden from Canberra uh, I knew did, did some work. This is going back away, 2007. Uh, it'd be interesting to do the studies again. But she found in 2007 uh, but that the insect numbers had increased by 600%, insect diversity by 125%, 
we had more insects, but we weren't getting insect attacking crops or pastures, which uh, is uh, interesting in itself. So, but what actually happened by, by restoring the grassland uh, and restoring and repairing the farm ecosystem, what what actually we, what what happened is we got more insects and we, we, primarily we got more and more predators, more 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 spiders and predatory wasps. Um, photo on I won't dwell on it too long, but the photo on, on down the bottom on the on the on the right is some seed native seed that we've harvested and it's full of lady beetles. And in fact, a lot of the seed that we harvest, the native seed, is, is full of spiders and lady beetles and all sorts of things. Sometimes we get more insects than we do get seed. So, but which is really interesting. That that's why we don't get insect attacking crops or pastures. Now, if we just look at this, um, so we need more insects to get to uh, control insect damage, which seems the opposite to what we should we should be doing. But we, if we get more insects, we'll get more predators, which will control the crop and pasture damaging or plant damaging uh, insects like red legged earth mite and, and blue rope mite and those ones. So um, we haven't used any fungicide for 25 years, no crop, no crop or pasture disease. disease. Um, how is that? I saw microbial tests, so huge increase in, in, in all soil microbes. Uh, fungus increased by 800%, I won't bother reading those. But um, we, by having healthy soil or a healthy soil ecosystem with a large diversity of soil microbes, it certainly will control plant, plant disease. Plant disease, uh, especially in cropping systems, is just simply a symptom of our crop growing methods or, our, or even our pasture, uh, pasture methods. So we haven't used fertil uh, pasture fertilizer as in superphosphate on the property for 45 years. Not since 1978. Um, and crop fertilizer has been reduced by 70% and moving more and more towards uh, um, uh, organic and biological type fertilizer. Um, so, how is that possible? Because we continually get told how much we need fertilizer. Um, if we're growing things, we're removing nutrients, all of these. So, we'll address all this in a minute, but this addresses it simply. Plants and plants and microbes make soil nutrients available. And living growing plants are the drivers of soil health, soil structure, and nutrient cycling. Um, the property here now, I've got just I'll explain what those two soil tests are. Um, the one on the left, uh, these these are adjoining paddocks. Um, my brother's property who who hadn't changed, he stayed the same. And the property here that that uh, that that I, I had changed. So what it's actually we're measuring here is a change in management. Now that's that's a half a metre deep, those soil samples, and um, a, a huge difference in, in just the look of those, those samples. They were only taken as close as we could get uh, through the fence, and the, the carbon levels, soil carbon levels were increased by, by 200% in, in the one on the left, and sequestered now uh, uh, nearly 60 tonne of, of carbon per hectare with 300 tonne of carbon dioxide it has sequestered um, compared to the other one. That one holds a lot more water than the one on the left and pH has changed from 5.2 to 6.1, no lime being, being put on it. Um, and the one on the left has had a lot, uh, virtually no fertiliser put on it except a little bit when we're growing crops. A bit more data on that. I won't dwell on this, um, but because it, for time. So if we look at that, we, those 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 soils were tested with everything we could test for, um, uh, and so you know, all all uh, nutrient min and minerals in there. So all the soil nutrients, including trace elements, have increased by an average of one hundred and sixty-two um, percent. And just looking at those, the only things that didn't change are the ones you really don't want. And that's um, iron, sodium, and aluminium. So if we get our soils functioning, they they will uh, fix themselves. <laughs> and 
So consequently, this data has created create an academic argument all around the planet because a lot of soil scientists and especially agronomists don't believe that this can happen. But I'm not the only one that this has happened to. A lot of the, the people who've changed their grazing management have had similar types of results to this. Um, a lot of the, re the reason, I, I won't dwell on this as well, but we can maybe answer some of this in question time later, uh, is simply that we've got bigger plant roots going a lot deeper and bringing nutrients up from depth that hadn't been accessed for probably 80 years. Th that's a, a simplistic answer for this, but it's a bit more detailed than that. Um, so is all this stuff profitable? And these, you know, if, if, you, you, if you're adopting uh, these method on, on your own property properties, or what, we obviously need to answer that, is it profitable? That $80,000 that I mentioned in my father's era and when I went, came back home here, uh, we don't spend that at all now. So we, we are $80,000 at, at least ahead every year before we even start. Um, now, most of that has, been, has happened because of, of, of uh, no fertiliser being put on. And if we look at this here, if we, uh, uh, the phosphorus levels are, are fine, uh, but, and, and all, all of them are fine. So you wonder why are we putting fertiliser on? So anyway, um, so it's $50,000 saved there, $20,000 on cropping costs. We don't re-establish pastures, and we we now, our pastures have over sixty species in them. Don't have insect attack. It's regenerative and resilient. The property is, and it functions. The property now functions in, in an ecologically sound way, and we're profitable. So, compared with with what we were doing before, annual income is higher. We're running more livestock than we did before. The crop yields are similar. Um, I, I, they're certainly not better than they were before the crop yields. They're similar to what they were before. Certainly wool quality is better because of grazing methods. And um, the wool quality is better because they have, have more a better diet. There's far more species to, uh, as, uh, grassland species to, to graze on. So um, we harvest and sell over, over two tonne of native grass seed a year. So there's a, a lot more profit there. Um, which wasn't even available before. Soil organic carbon levels are increasing. All those nutrients are increasing. And with $80,000 less inputs and less labour, that $80,000 doesn't cover labour costs at all. Uh, my father used to employ a lot more people than, than, than I do now. So, so how, how can we improve all this stuff, our properties, so, and, and address soil nutrient decline, plant disease, as well as being productive and profitable. How can we do all this without spending excessive amounts of money? Because ex spending excessive amounts of money is, is a big part of, of the problem with the industrial agriculture, form of agriculture. So it's really, it's, this stuff is real simple, actually. Allow our farms to function as ecosystems. Get out of the way and let old mother, drive it, old mother nature drive it for us. Uh, and, and but if our, our soils and farms function as ecosystems, we'll get better nutrient cycling, which is less fertilizer, increase soil carbon levels, increase increase soil water. So and we address all of those problems and and more profit. So our costs are so much less if we let Mother Nature drive it for us. So. The only way to really fix this is by growing more plants. It's really simple. Uh, growing more plants is the, is the answer to all of this. So we need to cover our soil and farms with a diverse range of living plants. But not monocultures of plants. Monoculture crops and monoculture type pastures or pastures with only two or three species in it are a big part of the problem. Now, we need either a perennial grassland or, or pasture. It doesn't have to be native, but it does need to function like a grassland. Um, and it need, it to function like a grassland, it needs to have a lot, a, a lot more species in it than we normally would sow as a pasture. Um, we, can use, we can use 
perennial cover crops, which is pasture cropping as well. Um, and well, this is really what I, what I did. Um, and, and or, or multi-species annual co covers. I haven't spoken about that very much today. So our farms and soils should function as ecosystems is really the key to this. Now, I'm going to see if I can address the reason why all those things happen. And I'm not the only one. When, when people change, when people change to what we're now commonly calling regenerative agriculture, we get all these amazing things happen. When I changed, I, I because I, I changed very early. There was no one doing this stuff. And I copped a lot of flack. And I copped a lot of flack because of this. Um, so, scientists were really, really puzzled. A lot of researchers and scientists were really puzzled. Well, it was more than puzzled. That they, they, they were quite aggressive towards many of us that ch changed early because they thought we were lying or fudging the figures or, or whatever. And it's puzzled scientists for many years. How can we achieve these things without fertilizer and pesticides and all that? Um, because and, and they're challenging it because that's what, what they have learned and what they know. Um, so, and it's it it is against what many people believe is possible. Um, and when you go when you get get out and, and start farming or or advising on regenerative ag practices there will be a pushback. So you need to be armed with a lot of this stuff. <laughs> so, okay. What I'm going to talk about here is re it's quite well known. So soil microbiology is, is well known. Some parts of this aren't so well known. So, but when we walk on the ground, we're actually walking on top of, of another world. Below our feet is a world that's more complex than the world we live in. Soil is not dirt. It might look like dirt, but it's the most abundant ecosystem on the planet. There's so many microorganisms in soil that a spoonful of healthy soil contains over 6 billion microbes. Now, we know all that. Uh, that's uh, 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 quite, yeah, quite commonly spoken about. So, now, there are very few microbes in soil that's been ploughed or had excessive amounts of pesticide applied. Now, if we look at, now, bees have got nothing to all do with this, except it's, it's a way of explaining what I'm, I'm going to talk about. Bees and, and ants, um, even schools of fish, many animals on our planet, or, or especially in, in the insect world, uh, form colonies which function as an organism. Bees are amazing. A creature. Well, a, a bee on its own is a fair, is, is, is a fairly uh, uh, dumb creature. It's not very bright at all, but put it together as a colony, and it's an amazing creature, uh, functioning as an as one organism. Bees, for example, can maintain their hives at exactly thirty five degrees. Um, uh, so we won't go, go so much into bees, other than when they work together, they are quite amazing, and and ants do the same 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 type of thing. Okay, we need to remember that soil is a, a living, breathing, some aquatic ecosystem. So um, what feeds billions of soil microbes? Plants feeds billions of soil microbes. Sugars from the roots, which has often been over, over, overlooked. A lot of the, the research work is about is focused on organic matter, not on root exudation. A bit more of that's happening now. In return, in return for uh, the root exudates and organic matter, microbes supply nutrients to plants. Now, remember the, 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 the bee colony? Microbes can also act together as an organism, as a, 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 a functioning organism. And in the microbial world, that's called quorum sensing. If you look at quorum sensing, quorum sensing also also causes can cause problems and diseases. But in the microbial world, in the soil health world, and and quorum sensing refers to density dependent coordinated behaviour that regulates 
gene expression in the microbial population and, and or the host host plant. Um, so it can regulate gene expression in, 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 in plants. Now, this is quite an amazing bit of film um, and it's showing red exudates coming out of a, of a plant root. Uh, and this is a big part of the key to a lot of this stuff. Soil microbial diversity is created by plant species diversity. Here we're getting back to a farm level um, and, 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 and plants and more plants and then plant diversity. So soil microbial diversity is created by plant species diversity. And different range of plants produces different root exudates. And these, those root exudates feed and support a vast range of soil microbes. So as we grow more and more, more plants and plant diversity, you know, we talk about our grasslands. The original grasslands in this country had 300 species in them. I can imagine how many microbes and, and, and different types of microbes that's feeding. Um, so this is really what starts start to happen. It looks as though this is what's happening when, when people change to regenerative form of agriculture and, and stop killing microbes and start, start to feed them. Um, so microbes in the soil or plant can switch genes on or off with, with this. So soil microbes drive the change. A diverse and vast range of soil microbes simulate plant health, uh, plant growth, plant health, uh, cycle nutrients create tolerance to drought and, and plant disease suppression. And all of that stuff starts to happen when we get things functioning well on our properties. Um, that's the type of thing that's happened here when I talk about le less uh, plant disease, uh, um, certainly more tolerance, tolerance to, 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 to drought. So, and also that's why plant monocultures don't work. That's why ploughing and, and excessive use of micro killing inputs like high rates of fertilizer and pesticides destroy the soil ecosystem because we're killing microbes. And, and destroying microbial diversity. So how do we restore our farms? Grow more plants, it's real easy. <laughs> Grow more plants, plants, plants and more plants. Plants restore our farm soil and profit. So how did I change? I grew more plants, really simple. But I grew more plants by changing the way I grazed and I, I grew more plants by changing the way I grew the crops. I didn't just go out and plant a whole lot of different, different types of plants. I changed the, gra the grazing management or well, grazing methods and changed the, the, the cropping methods. So to sum all this up, um, agricultural methods don't have to destroy our farms, ecosystems and, and, and the planet. Good agricultural practices can produce vast, vast amounts of high quality food. We don't have to worry about food the numbers of people on this planet, which is another thing is often said about regenerative agriculture. Oh, that form of agriculture won't, won't feed enough people on the planet. Yes, it will. In fact, I'd, I'd suggest that we can grow far more food with these methods. So, um, so we, we, we can produce vast amounts of high quality food. We can regenerate grasslands with these methods. We can restore farm and soil ecosystems and we can help restore our ailing planet. Thank you. Thank you, Colin, and a huge Zoom round of applause from our live audience here today. Thank you so much. Wow. Um, I know I've got a huge number of questions that came up during that presentation and uh, you've got a lovely way of presenting to Colin. You know, a lot of these issues are obviously extremely serious and you've got a wicked sense of humour that made that um, very, very engaging, uh, very interesting to learn about. Um, we've got a, uh, a couple of comments slash questions in the chat already from our visitor, um, Lorraine, Gordon, who's been able to come and meet with us today. She's the director of our program. Hi, yeah. Lorraine. Hi. Hi. Hi, Carl. Great presentation. Hi. Thank you so much. I was first half an hour on the phone and then quickly into my office to get you up on Zoom. So thank you so much for your time today. It's been awesome. Yeah, thank you. 
I did have a couple of questions in the chat. I'll let I'll go back to Simone to manage that. <laughs> hey, sure, you can you do and ask them live, Lauren. Um, yeah. Look, my first question is around microbes. Um, and I had uh, a scientist, actually a microbiologist, come onto our farm the other day and uh, take some soil samples because I was about to apply compost teas and compost across the farm. When he took all of that back to his lab, he, dis he actually said, if you do this, um, and I think Bruce Maynard has actually discovered this as well. He said, you're introducing all these foreign microbes and what you potentially do is start a war under the ground between microbes. And you can actually do a lot of damage because the plants start to switch off because the microbes are too busy eating each other and fighting and everything else, rejecting the foreign microbes. And so yeah. what, and this is Jeremy Bradley, um, who's um, one of our uh, lecturers at SCU, actually said was you're better off just to feed the microbes you've got in the ground and not introduce uh you know foreign microbes into that system unless you don't have um the diversity of say mycorrhizal fungi and everything else you need if you're lacking in something so i'm just i'm yeah. really interested in your comments on this because we're advocating for you know, compost and compost teas. It's one of the ERF methodologies for sequestering carbon. But I'm, yeah. I'm really interested in what your thoughts are on that. Yep. I, I'd i agree with it. I'd agree with what you've said. Um, I, and I've often, I thought this all, all along. Why introduce uh, microbes when all we really need to do is feed the ones that we've got? Mm. And the best microbial food we've got uh, plant root exudates mm. like um mm. uh yeah there, there's a lot of things there about feeding my a lot of products out there not not that compost tea it, 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 you know you can brew your own and which is which is fine but a lot of products out there selling microbes and all these many things uh moment well, well, tend to be called a bug bug in a jug um when when we really only need to feed the ones we've got and there will be like Unless your farm has been ploughed for a long time and, and nuked with, with really yeah. strong uh, uh, chemicals, there will be enough microbes there to build the, them up. And the best way is to is to grow uh, more plants. And I, although I didn't talk about it really much at all today because of the time frame, um, one of the methods that I use to get farmers to to uh, kickstart their property. And, and I, I do a lot of on-farm stuff and, and a lot of mentoring with, with, with farmer groups. And one of the best ways to do it, do that is with multi-species crops. Mm. They're commonly called cover crops, but a cover crop is actually probably the wrong definition. So just, just a simple, simply a multi-species crop with as many species in it as you can grow. And that's limited by your imagination, but you tend to run out of ideas at about 15 <laughs> species. So um but grow a multi-species crop, you can grow summer ones. Uh, and what, what I do, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to speed this up a bit. You get a really degraded paddock. Um, uh, gra gra sorry, we'll start, start a winter multi-species crop with as many of those. And it, it's a forage crop, so you graze that. Follow that up straight afterward with a summer multi-species crop. Um, then repeat that the following year. And just that process, which you had four crops in two years, and they're grazed. Uh, so you're making income off them, mm. and it will turn that that paddock around. It will yeah. fix the soil structure to start with, providing you, you you need the right mix of plants, but they're not they're not not uh, they're only fairly common plants, in, in mixes, um, and getting some really good results of turning paddocks around, fix them really quite rapidly, still generating income off them, and restoring the paddocks, and then you just keep going on on your farm. It occurs to me, Cole, that people do soil testing to test what uh, mineral deficiencies they may have in the soil, but what they're not actually testing is how many, you know, what their microbial activity looks like. And perhaps they should be looking at both. Um, yeah. My yeah. other, my only other question, I don't want to hog the question time, but I, I'm really interested in this and I'm a little bit gobsmacked that you, that you say you're only saving $80,000 
a year. <laughs> um, I, for the life of me, can't see how that figure can be so low. Uh, yeah. So do you want to just elaborate on that? Is that because mm. you're still applying those um, mineral inputs and various organic inputs? Or, yeah, I would think that that figure on today's standard with the cost of superphosphate, urea, uh, fungicides and pesticides would be far greater than 80,000 over that land area. So I'm just wanting to unpack how you think it's only 80,000. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I, I was actually going to uh, yesterday uh, redo those figures and, and you're spot on. I, I think it'd be closer to 120, but there's no labour count in that either. So it's probably 200,000. Uh, it, it'd, be good, it'd be a good exercise for you to do that because I think you're going to get a shock. <laughs> I need to update. I need to update. The reason I didn't put labour in it originally, because I've been talking about saving this money now for a long time, I thought if I put this, this if I put labour on that and, and quoted two hundred thousand, no one will believe this. Um, so I I did deliberately keep it lower um, because it's a bit like um, if, if you try and uh, when I, I get. It, it, uh, hang on. When I go on to property, uh, um, encouraging people to change, I get them to change, to transition slowly, not all at once. Mm. If you get them to, to try and change too quickly, they often won't adopt it. Mm. So it's a bit of a transition. I guess I had the same, same thing in when I was looking at those figures. Thank you, Carl. I'll shut up now, Simone. Back to you. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Lorraine. Great questions and, and comments there as well. Um, we've got another one in the chat, Colin, from Marg Gillespie. Did you want to jump on your mic, Marg, and ask Colin directly? I'm okay. Happy to... Thank you, Colin, for your time today. This is very informative. Colin, we're up here at Tabulum between Casino and Tenerfield, and we've got a 60-acre paddock that has been planted with soy in the summer, followed by winter oats. Um, for several years, then it got wet and we didn't plant for a couple of years and it's been rested, but it's got every species known to man in it now. But we do want to put winter oats in this year. And, um, you know, we have, we have sprayed it out in the past, obviously, and direct drilled. We've got a, a direct drill with um, narrow tines for direct drilling. Okay. What do you suggest is the best way to go about putting the oats in it this year? given that it has got quite a high concentration of um, grasses and other material. Okay. No, it's no interesting sheep, only cattle. Uh, yeah. Interesting you say that, that it's got a, a whole heap of different species on it. <laughs> Mother Nature is very, very clever. Um, and that's exactly what happens when, when a paddock is trying... Well, uh, natural systems want to heal themselves and and what happens is that old oh, mother nature throws a whole heap of weeds on an area like that on bare ground and, and given time those weeds will fix the paddock not suggesting you get you you do that we're not going to make much money out of growing weeds so but but that that's actually how to fix how to fix the paddock the reason why i, I took the the question that lorraine asked was um uh, with those multi-species crops, think, if you think about it this way, uh, I'm assuming that oats is for for grazing. Is that correct? You, 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 yes. You, yeah. Purely yeah. grazing. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yes. If uh, as well as oats, oats is a great plant. Uh, as well as oats, you include things like um, turnips and, even, and, and, and and radishes and field peas and vetch um, and what else? A lot, a lot more. Uh, even lupins. <laughs> anything you think of that grows in the winter period. Um, some all at the same time. Um, the little seeds like turnips, uh, you, you may may not be, if you're sowing just like with the time drill, they may go too deep. But providing they're all a similar size, you can just sow them all together, you mix them up in the box. Um, what will happen is that you will grow, grow a lot more feed for, for your cattle they'll do a lot better on it um, and you'll fix the paddock um, as I said there, described there a while ago. Um, now, um, uh, so 
Uh, oh, that, that's what I was going to say. Uh, I did a, I did a, a trial here. It was an MLA slash land care trial. I, I won't dwell on this too much, but I'm, we monitored that very, very carefully. It was done um, in 2020, I think. And, and, and it was a multi-species crop, just like I, I said. We were running sheep on it. And what I, I, had, I had just had a crop of barley and one, one, in one paddock, split a paddock in half and, and a multi-species crop like that. And we weighed these, these merino lambs right through from start, uh, grazed the paddocks for two months. So they had three weighings. The lambs doubled in weight on the multi-species crop compared to the barley crop. Mm. Um, there was double the, 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 the profit on it. It was quite amazing. So what I'm saying here, if you can do that, your costs will be a little bit higher with buying that seed, but not a lot. But you'll grow a lot more feed and your cattle will do a lot better on, the, on that. A and you will fix the soil. So, so should we um, put the cattle on it and heavily graze it and sort of crash it first or is it better to slash it to get it down? No, graze it. Graze it as hard as you can with, with a mob of dry cows or steers or something, as hard as you can. They'll put a lot of manure and urine on there as well. Um, I trample a lot of those plants. How are you going to sell it? Were you going to use herbicide and spray it out? And, and, no, we, and we, then... didn't want to, we didn't want to spray it out. Um, okay. Should we use a little bit of fertiliser first time around or just go? I'd, I'd use yeah. fertiliser. Like part of, of, of uh, fixing our farms is, is that transition time period. We need to be really careful when we first start. Um, and I worry about people uh, wanting to become organic straight away. Nothing wrong with being organic. But um, uh, I try to do things that is, is extremely difficult and, and, and really setting themselves up to fail. So some fertilizer, if there's a lot of weeds in there that are actively growing and going to compete with, with, the, with, the, uh, with the crop, you need some sort of weed control. This is to start with this transition as well. Um, right. Because you need to grow a, grow a decent crop to get a, a reasonable result, like soil health and, and, and feed. So, um, one of the problems, though, with with fertilizer, oh, sorry, with pet with with herbicides, is Roundup itself. Um, mm. Around even forgetting about all the the, the health problems, um, Roundup just works too well and kills everything. A lot of the yeah. times we don't need to kill everything. Like if there's perennial pasture plants in there, what do you want to kill them for? So if you can use a more selective a selective uh, uh, plant to kill most of the weeds, some weed control, you, you, you can do it. And if, if those weeds are already growing um, before you start, they will affect the crop if they're green and growing. Um, yeah. 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 You need to be a bit careful about that and how to transition. Yeah, so get a selective herbicide. Yeah, if you've, so. got, if you've got a whole leaf of broad leaves in there, that's not a big problem. You can just use a broad leaf herbicide and, and take them out so you're still not using using Roundup. It, it probably might often the those early colonizing species are, are broad leaves. And that's yeah, yeah. that's difficult. Thank you very much, Colin. Thanks for your question, Marg. And thanks for such an in-depth response there to Colin. Um, does anyone else have a question? Um, you can raise your hand or pop it in the chat if you like. I might ask one then if there's a little break. Oh, um, oh yeah, sorry, we've got Adrian there. Go for it, Adrian. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. How you going, Colin? Good, good. Mate, uh, do you use any biological inoculants on your seeds? When you're sowing, okay. Um, I over the years I've tried just about everything. <laughs> I I have tried compost teas. Um, I've got liquid injection set up on my seed drill. Um, and the, the quick answer to that is no, I don't. Um, I'd suggest if you want to use something like that, uh, worm leachate, wor worm worm products are probably as good as you could use. Um, the reason why is um, I, I don't use any bi biological products is uh, what I said earlier, I went, the penny drop with me is the best microbial food on the planet, uh, plant root exudates. Mother Nature's 
microbial food. So that's why I've had gone down the gravel plants direction. Yep. Um, nothing wrong. I, I I don't think there's any much or anything wrong with any of those products, but I I and so I'm not saying don't don't use them. They're certainly better than using a, a chemical version or something like that. Hmm. I don't yeah, know if that answered. I, 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 or just to add, add something to that, with, with um, the basic uh, agronomic principles still apply with a lot of this stuff. I mean, uh, especially in transition, we, we do need to, to make sure, uh, and, I, I, and I said that bit with the last question, uh, we do need to make sure we're going to get these plants to grow. So uh, we need to make sure they're not going to get smothered by weeds and, and that there's enough nutrient there to grow the plant. Um, uh, so, and, and this includes um, inoculants on legumes, like um, uh, um, also, you know, that you, you, we should be putting those on there as, you, as we have before. Uh, so a lot of the uh, agronomic principles still apply with this, but we're doing it a bit differently, um, but the broad principles apply, uh, but we, you know, we, we, we're not, uh, killing as many plants as we used to. We're trying to zero till, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Yep. I don't know whether that answered your question or not. No, nah, that was good. Thanks, mate. Okay. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks, Colin. I've got another question from um, Graham in the chat. Graham, did you want to hop on your mic as well? Um, no problem if not. Hi, well, Colin. Yeah, great, great chat. Um, I've got poor internet service here at Mill Marin, so that's why I don't have my video going. Um, last couple of years, uh, myself and a couple of mates out here have been doing a bit of um, basically no-kill cropping or, or whatever in the pasture. Um, at this point in time, we have had no great success in, in any of it that's anything that's been stand out, even though... Um, they are using very good gear, um, boss planters and that sort of thing, and they basically yeah do do both farming and a very good cattle enterprise. Um, but yeah, I was just wondering if there's something we are missing, or if there's something that um, you believe, like basically there there is a twenty hectare paddock that um, they have been um, or we've been playing around with, and um, as I say, it, one, one year it did do a great crop of oats, but um, since we've gone down the no-kill type, no fertiliser or anything, it's, yeah, you get plants up roughly about, um, yeah, six, eight inches high, and then they don't do anything. Um, and then also last year, we had probably one of the wettest seasons um, that we've had for a long time. And we had a very good experiment where they went through and just uh, spread with a spreader, um 10 hectares and then the spreader broke down so then they hooked the boss on and and um basically yeah single disc or double disc it, um the rest of it in and there's no difference in the germination but once yeah. again um yeah you it, it grew yeah six eight inches and even put out some some of the oats put out ahead at six eight inches where oats next door to it basically two foot high um is there something we're missing i suppose Yep, yep. Um, that's, you're talking about no cure, as in Bruce, Bruce Maynard's methods. Um, Basically, it's sort um, of going down that pathway, yeah, if we can, yeah. Yeah, so the, the principles with, with Bruce's are with no kill is to sow it dry before any of those weeds germinate. And that's the, the main way of, uh, of getting those plants ahead of, 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 the, um, uh, of the weeds. And as I said a while ago, if, if you're actually sowing into plants that are already growing, it's going, it, it, it's a fair chance you'll set yourself up to fail. So I'm not sure whether whether um, it, it, it just what you're doing in that sense. It's, uh, well, can you answer that? Uh, when you're sowing it, uh, are, are, there, are there green plants in there or growing yeah. plants? Yeah, so that's okay. basically what we have noticed. And yeah, any bare soil, that is where it goes great guns. But yeah, yeah, so basically you're saying we do need to nuke it with something prior to planting, I'm presuming. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, it's uh, I've seen more failures done that way that than that than not. Like again, as I said before, the basic principle agri ag agronomy agronomic principles still apply. Like and especially if you're sowing into something that's already growing, they they've got a head start on on what's trying to germinate, and they'll just outcompete them. So uh, you know whatever method you want to use, um, need to do something about those weeds if they've already germinated. Um, uh, and, and you'll get we'll get a better result uh, sowing dry before they, they the weeds germinate because then everything germinates at the same time, which is what, what Bruce Maynard's developed. Um, and and, uh, and 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 at least they're <laughs> they're on the starting blocks together, all, all those plants. But yeah, I, I've never it, it, really sown that way. I've done something about the weeds, um, but I I haven't used in saying that I haven't used Roundup for probably nearly thirty years. But I have used more selectives and I've used desiccant type herbicides um, that, that won't kill perennial plants. But, but annual weed, annual weed um, uh, uh, things that, yes, yeah, yeah, so if there's annual weeds, weeds growing, you'll, you'll need to do something with them. That, that'd yeah, be that's... the main thing. Yeah, that'd be the main thing. You may, you may, uh, and I, I'd put some fertilizer in it. Like when we, as I said earlier, with, with all this stuff, we need to transition into where, where we want to be um, because most of the soils that we've got really aren't cycling nutrients very well, um, especially if they're hard and compacted and whole cropping country. You know, the, the, the nutrients aren't available and, and especially if they're, they're not cycling. And um, so we need to get something happening on there. And, and if that takes a bit of fertilizer, that's fine. I, I often you, the, the fertilizer, doesn't need to be anywhere near as high as a, a normal recommendation. It'd be probably half of that, but but uh, you need you will need I, I think some fertilizer in there to make sure you get a result and the plants are growing. You're not going to be able to fix your property unless you actually grow plants. No worries. Thank you very much. Great question, Graham. Thanks, Colin, for your response as well. Um, I'm not sure if there's any other questions. I might try and sneak mine in now if I can. I did just want to say, I I remember back, um, I'll, I'll say straight up, I'm not a farmer in, in my background at all, but I'm an environmental educator. And I remember about 20 years, I watched this movie um, by Al Gore, An Inconvenient Truth. And he, he showed this graph. And it became, I guess, quite a, it was a bit of a game changer, that graph in terms of, what people are thinking because the numbers don't lie. And I got that in your presentation as well. Um, it, it's, it, was, uh, it startled me and um, it devastated me in the same breath, um, you know, to see, I guess that correlation between what's happening behind the scenes and what farmers are actually receiving themselves, you know, when as a consumer, that's not what you think about when you're purchasing food and, and when you're purchasing, you know, your groceries, you don't think that the farmers aren't getting the majority of what you're, what you're paying. Um, I was really curious where, if you knew the, like the source of that study or if there's been anything similar done in Australia, I think you said it was from Canada. Is that correct? That was Canadian. You can find that uh, uh, also. I, I should try and find it, get the, um, the actual link to it, that Canadian one. Yeah, it'd be nice yeah. to get this, uh, that, that done in Australia as well. Um, I think it'd be very similar. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I would assume so too, both being um, given our social um, structures are very similarly set up. Um, yeah. But it's, but it's brilliant just to see, I guess, the impact that um, regenerative agriculture can have in that kind of, I guess, social economic side as well as obviously what it's doing environmentally for the land that was just a really powerful moment um, for me uh, i see shane's got a question perhaps did you want to jump on the mic shane yeah i will thank you i yeah i can't work out how to do it but um yeah, yeah g'day colin thanks for having a yarn it's yeah yeah it's amazing uh, what you're doing down there um i just wanted to ask a question about we've got a a, a center pivot um, that's had a pretty hard time, and um, yeah, just how, how would you attack that? It's you know, 
got the best crop of flea bane going. Um, yeah, how would you attack that? Okay, where where are you at? Um, Westmar, um, yeah, southern Queensland. Okay, right. Yep, yep. So Place yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Um, and I'd imagine that centre pivot area is starting to get well. It's getting flea bane on it. Um, probably just growing a whole heap of weeds that you don't want. I'd imagine Is that that correct. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'd use the same type of principle. I oh, oh, hang on. How reliant on you? Like, are you using that as a as a cash crop? Um, like, is no, it, you, only, only grazing. Yeah, only grazing. Oh, okay. Right. Mm. Because a cash crop answer would be a bit different. Um, right. I, I'd I'd use uh, use the, what I just spoke about before. Fix it with multi-species crops. There's no reason why. Um, if you grow a, a really good mix of multi-species crops, you know, as many as as many as your many species as your imagination will allow uh, in, in your environment and grow a winter one, then followed by a multi-species summer one, in your environment, you've got more options again for summer uh, as well um, than we than you have further south. So um, uh, and, and do it that way. Graze it, uh, generate income off your make far more money growing a multi-species crop than a single species. Like the summer, I haven't mentioned the, the summer ones, but the su summer ones can be um, uh, things like mill generally sorghum. I just talk about sorghum. Sorghum generally grows a, a bit, a bit too high for if we're putting a mix of species in there. It'll get up ahead and and, and then suppress some of the other small, shorter ones underneath. So if you go with millet or something that's a bit shorter, and then anything you can think of, like you can grow lab lab beans where, where you are, there's a mix, lab lab, uh, uh, cow peas, millet, uh, or if you sow sorghum, I sow it at extremely low rate, so you've only got a little bit in there. Um, uh, sunflowers, um, <laughs> you know, it goes on and on. Uh, you, what, what, you could, what you could grow in your environment. Um, as well as all those winter ones as well that we mentioned before, uh, you, you'll get it'll be far more productive um, than, than a single species of either, either winter or summer but better than that you you'll fix your, your soil in that in that paddock like uh, irrigating uh, irrigation areas generally get hard and compacted um, uh, often with over the years probably too much water on them uh, and and so you need to fix that so um, plants like turnip and tillage radish and those uh, and, and sunflowers as well with, with a big taproot on it will, will help fix that the soil structure in, 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 in that area. But again, uh, uh, multi-species mixes, they're all annuals, I might add. They're not, they're not perennial plants. Um, you, maybe eventually you, you could sell it to a really good mix of, 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 um, of perennial plants so you get feed all year round like where you don't have to continue to sow things just as an example yeah, that'd, that'd be a wall down the track to get that soil to, to yes yeah, yeah. cycles again that's also while i mentioned while i think of that someone fixing a paddock not necessarily yours but but someone fixing a paddock using this method like eventually you want you want to get to uh, to sow a permanent pasture on it on, on a paddock now, what those those uh, multi-species mixes like a winter one, a summer one, then repeat it again, primes the soil biologically, so you'll get a better result when you sow a really good mix of pastures. And when I say a mix of pastures, think about ten or, or even if you can think that as many, even twenty in a, in, in a part, permanent perennial pastures mix as well. Uh, if you sow that. Can be very very low rates. It doesn't. It won't necessarily be any more expensive to sow twenty there as, as as two, but because you only put a little bit in of each one, um, so that's just something to that I thought of there. We're using those multi-species uh, crops to prime the soil to then plant a more permanent pasture in them as well, and it can be used the other way. Um, prime the soil after, after some of those, those multi-species mixes, then to sow a cash crop in it as well. It, it, you'll get a far better cash crop like wheat or, or whatever after those multi-species crops uh, than, than before. And 
uh, add a lot of nutrients as well with those 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 uh, uh, plants, fixed soil structure, all that. And then they then they're generally referred to as a cover crop if you're using them to uh, to uh, pr before sowing a cash crop. What um like we've only got small areas. Like what what would you recommend as a as a planter to use um to yeah because we struggle to get people to do it because it's only small areas. Yeah, what what would you recommend? It's always always a problem um, getting uh, uh, contractors to sow. And if you can, you have your own equipment. It, it's always better because you can get it on, done on time. Not always possible. That, that machinery is expensive. Now, what I what I did early days, I often recommend is that one of the problems with zero till equipment is that they cost hundred thousand dollars or something, or at least fifty or sixty thousand. You can actually uh, convert existing machinery reasonably cost effectively. Old seed drills, old combines, can, you, you can put discs and tines under them. Tines are a lot are a lot cheaper to convert that, than a disc, um, and, and we get a really good result, especially if your soils are hard and compacted. You get a better result with 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 a tine and a knife point. Than you will with a disc in, in really hard compacted soils. And I've, I've had uh, people convert old chisel plows by putting a seed box on them, all, all this sort of stuff. Some people are very inventive uh, and, and do it quite quite cheaply. And they've often got old machinery lying around that they, that they do that with. Do you, so you, you, do you run tines or discs yourself? I, I've start, uh, I started with tines. And I've just recently converted the, uh, the only this season, the machine to to uh, uh, double discs, mainly because we, we uh, talk about shoot yourself in the foot. Uh, the grasslands have become that good here now that there's that much grass on them. We're struggling to get through them with the, with the time. So I sort of forced myself to to go to a disc. But for years I, I just used a time uh, and a knife point. Thanks for that, that's excellent, thank you. Thanks Shane. And Graham's just popped one more in the chat, which I'll just ask quickly before we sign off for today, but um, he's just asked how many years there were between those soil tests that showed the great improvements in all the minerals. How many years? Yeah, yeah. Years. Okay, um, yeah, depending on what we're talking about, the, the soil carbon tests are an interesting one. Um, they were done over about a 10 year period. I did, we, we've tested that, that same area there uh, for at least four times over a 10 year period. Um, uh, some things happen quite quickly. Uh, if it, uh, I, I found that the insects came back quite quickly and, and, and stopped insect attacking crop. But when I say quickly, three, four years, uh, and, and often there, there is a lag time, but but generally three to five, somewhere in there, things will be going okay, uh, mostly. But there, there will be a lag time. Sometimes when you change, you know, next year you're going to hold a weeds and you think, geez, that was a bloody disaster. I won't do that again. <laughs> but <laughs> but we, you know, we need to persist and, and just think about what's going on and what old Mother Nature's doing. She's working a lot harder than you trying to fix it. Um, <laughs> And she's only got work to work with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, does that answer that one for you, Graham? Thanks. Thanks so much, Colin. And, and very true there. It was it was fascinating to see you, I think it was in the 70s with your plow, that picture of yep. your your land, and then to see that photo you had recently. Like you said, it was unrecognizable. It was just yep. phenomenal to see that that change over time. And I I wonder. You know, for people just moving into, you know, making that transition to regen ag practices and, and principles in terms of how they farm, you know, how um, how patient we can be in a way, and and how much we can, um, you know, take take that like kind of a bit of a slow approach, I guess, pushing back against the industrial, you know, quick fast food kind of um, mentality, perhaps, yeah. Yeah, we do need to be patient. It's, that's, that's good. I'm very, really pleased you said that. Um, Mother Nature will take her own time. We can speed it up and 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 tweak it around the edges, but we don't need to interfere too much. But but we can certainly manipulate it a little bit. Um, 
transitioning is very, very important. Um, we don't want to go broke while we're, while we're transitioning. Mm. Um, what I did, and, and I, I realised I'd, I'd talk all day if you let me, but... but <laughs> we, we, <laughs> and we'd I, listen, I think. <laughs> We need, need to wind up. Um, uh, I changed very, very slowly. All that I did with the fertilizer is we started. We started with 100 kilos of DAP and MAP, and I just cut them back every every year or so, and just realised and did the experimentally, did just a couple of strips through the paddock, just wound the fertilizer back. Saw no difference in the yield, so I cut it back a bit more. Um, but we we can just you just do really simple on farm trials ourselves. Uh, you don't go back while you while you're changing, so don't go back. Don't, don't change too quickly. Uh, uh, do it do it slower and more carefully. Mm, great advice, Colin and um, uh, keep one of the participants here is uh, thanking you for your generous sharing of experience, knowledge, and care for land as well. So um, I think behalf on behalf of everyone here and on behalf of the program, um, we do want to extend. Our, our appreciation for your time today and sharing everything that you've shared. Um, we've also got a few a few people on our webinar today who are part of the the um, Australian government's um, future draft fund that has been supporting the ramp pro this ramp program. So it's great to have them all here to to hear about kind of what we get up to it uh, at ramp as well. So thank you for sharing your knowledge with our ramp participants and, and all of us here today. It's just been, um, yeah, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much. <laughs> As Lorraine says in the chat, thanks for your time and energy today, Colin. You are a legend. <laughs> I wholeheartedly agree, Lorraine. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank thanks, you. Colin. Thanks. Thanks, Colin. See you, everyone.